Hi and welcome back to my last part of my 2.4 gigahertz amplifier build. Now if you haven't seen my last two parts then let me just quickly explain. So the palette here is an E-Reon Power Blast 300 which is capable of producing 250 watts CW with just a mere 160 milliwatt input. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be running this amplifier at full power, so having some headroom is quite nice. Primarily, this is going to be used on QO100 for DATV, so we're going to be using anything between 50 and 100 watts, and then when I use it for narrowband, probably only around 5 watts. So the idea was was to get this palette from Erion and then build it into a box. So one, all the electronics are protected and shielded and also anybody that's near the amplifier is also protected from any straight RF. Obviously at 2.4 gigahertz, you do not want to be near it when it's on. So I've now got the palette installed and it's bolted on to the bottom of the heatsink. I'll show you the top of it in a moment. Between the aluminium block that the PCB is mounted onto and the heat sink, I've used the Arctic grease or Arctic paste, which is normally used for CPU coolers. The Arctic paste is supposedly one of the best pastes to use. So just to explain a bit about the circuit, we've got 28 volts coming in here, which feed off just to a LED over here to show that there's power going on. We've then got the input here, which is an N-type that comes into the input side of the amplifier. We have two thick black and red cables here, which go around and connect to the amplifier. And that's always connected permanently to the power supply. There is an enable pin, which is that thin red wire there, which goes off to a switch. And what happens is, is when the switch is down, it means that the enable pin is actually grounded. So it doesn't flow and it doesn't potentially turn on by itself, etc. Not that it would, but it's best to always ground an enable pin on an amplifier like this. When the switch is pushed up, 28 volts is then sent to the enable pin, which in effect enables the amplifier. There's also a red LED, which is connected to the same switch, which illuminates when the amp is enabled. So this is the RF output side, and that goes to an N-type connector as well on the chassis. This cable, the blue cable that you can see, it's using SM14150R which is extremely rigid coax and it's specifically used because it can handle high power and high temperatures. Obviously it's quite important to use coax like this because the dielectric could probably heat up quite a lot when you're running lots of power and especially at microwave frequencies. Now what some of you might notice of those of you that have seen my last video is that I've now removed the board that was over here. I had a little buck converter which took 28 volts and took it down to 12 volts. Now that 12 volts was then connected to the two fans which are on top of the heatsink which were actually connected in parallel. One of you guys had a very good suggestion about connecting the fans in series. So essentially putting 28 volts across two 12 volt fans. Now okay, it's slightly over voltage and it's probably gonna be running a bit faster and potentially the fans might not last as long as if I was running on 12 volts. Two extra volts per fan is not a big deal. In fact, I had it turned on and running for well over an hour and there was no issues. The fans didn't smoke and everything was working fine. The last thing here that we're looking at is the temperature sensor. Now this is bolted through the box into the heatsink. Uh, this is a one wire sensor, so it's fed by five volts from my Raspberry Pi, which will be connected via a cable. And then you've got a one wire data pin, which sends back the temperature data back to the Pi, which then I display on node red. Now, if I just turn it over and just show you the front, as you can see, I've just printed off some labels. I know what each connector is, but you never know what's going to happen in the future. Someone might come across this in 100 or 200 years time and think to themselves, what the heck is it? Where should I plug things in? Obviously, in 120 years time, I won't be around, so I won't be able to tell them. So with this, 160 milliwatt maximum and temperature sensor and the enable switch, the green LED will illuminate when there's 28 volts. Now, 
I'm not going to be putting in 160 milliwatts. I'm not going to be putting anything near that into this. In fact, my driver that comes from my main transmitter can only go up to about 48 milliwatts, which may or may not be enough. I won't really know until I get this connected up and in line. So the other side of the amplifier, oh, the other thing that I was going to mention is about the heat sinks. Now, how did I mount the heat sinks? Well, somebody mentioned to me about putting some rubber in between the fins and then screwing into it. That was a really good idea. So I've actually got a rubber grommet here, not Wallace, but it's a rubber grommet. Uh, and that actually gives me enough tension to put the bolt the other side here and it pushes really snug and tight up against this fin so I'm actually able to use the, the bolt through it and it keeps it nice and tight it's exactly the same the other end so if I just turn the amp round so you can see the rear of it not much going on here apart from you've got the RF output which obviously I've labeled and again it's an N type female and with then we've got our 28 volt DC input now according to the specifications at full power it does actually require 18 amps but again we're probably only going to be running this at a fifth of what it can possibly do so hopefully it won't use that much current not that it matters because my power supply can actually handle up to 30 35 amps at 28 volts you can also see here that I've now got a cable coming through grommeted cable through the chassis which is the power wire for the two fans on top okay so let's have a quick look at the circulator and I'll show you where it's going to connect to so this is the isolator that I'll be using with the amplifier at first just to make sure nothing bad happens and the pallet is protected at least on the output side now this isolator from UIY.com has been specifically built for me and tuned to the frequencies that I wanted to transmit on. So around 2.405 gigahertz with a bandwidth of around 100 megahertz. Now this isolator is terminated, meaning that the reflected power from the antenna will be dissipated into the built-in 50 ohm load. Now you can get isolators or circulators without built-in termination. So in that case, you would need to provide your own, like a dummy load for example. If you're not sure what isolators do, then let me briefly explain. If you're familiar with radio transmitters and antennas, then you will have some knowledge about SWR, standing wave ratio. And this is a measurement of reflected power from your antenna. Now, reflected power is normally a result of a mismatch in the impedance of your antenna, or in other words, the antenna is not tuned for the frequency you're transmitting on. Other sources of reflected power can be from breaks or shorts in the coax that's feeding the antenna. This particular amplifier palette will not be happy with an SWR of greater than 2, meaning the output component will most likely blow up and become faulty if it experiences that. To protect the amplifier, I'll place this isolator on the output between the amp and the antenna, so that if any reflected power greater than 1.5 is returned to the amp, then that power will be sunk into the 50 ohm termination and dissipated as heat. Now let me talk about the company where I ordered this isolator from, because after so much research for this type of product, it was clear that I needed to contact a company that specialised in these types of designs. There are many out there on the market from the likes of AliExpress and eBay, but I wanted to use a company that I could trust and know what they're doing, especially after all the time and effort that I've put into building this amplifier. Now the company I used was UIY.com who are based in China. Now I had lengthy conversations with Dan, one of their technical guys, and I explained exactly what I was building. I even sent them photos of the amp build and of course links to the previous parts of the video series. Now after some talks and finalizing on the specification, they set out to build the isolator for me. Now I requested that the isolator had a termination, meaning I didn't need to worry about an external dummy load when in use. After the order was placed, their engineer contacted me to finalise the tuning to make sure that I was happy with the final specifications. Now, I won't talk about pricing because it will be different for everyone if you want something custom made, but they do have a standard price list you can ask for via their website. They do have lots and lots of different products that are in stock and will most likely suit your needs. Now, their website shows off all of the different products that they manufacture. And although they mainly deal with microwave products, they do have some for VHF and the UHF range. 
Products range from coaxial isolators to surface mount isolators, along with circulators, RF filters, attenuators, dummy loads, power dividers, and spitters. And lastly, duplexes and triplexes, which can be tuned to the customer's requirements. So if you're looking for a company to either buy an off-the-shelf microwave component or have something custom made, then I highly recommend UIY.com. Now this isn't sponsored in any way, it's just that I've already done the work to find a reputable company to make the part for me and I'm just sharing it with you. So we've reached the time to connect it all up and see if all of this effort and work has paid off. As you can see here, the isolator is attached directly to the amplifier output. This then feeds into a minus 40 dB coupler, which has my homemade power sensor connected to. The main output of the coupler then goes off to the transmitting patch antenna, which is on my 1.2 meter dish outside. Now, after flicking the enable switch, I quickly ran back indoors to the shack to load up a web browser to show me my Node-RED dashboard. Now, as I had changed to a different one wire sensor, I have to log into the configuration node and redeploy as the one wire sensor ID had changed. Now, flipping over to the main Node Red user interface, I was quite pleased to see that the temperature sensor was working. Now it's time to load up all of the other software to make this work. Now, I do have other videos on how all of this software works, so if you've not yet seen it before, then I recommend you go watch it. But of course, if you have any questions, then you can leave them down in the comments and I'll get around to replying to them. So this is my first transmission up onto QA100 DATV using this new E-Rion Powerblast 300 amplifier. And guess what? It works. I am so pleased. Now, one thing that I've noticed is that my signal is not as high as it was with my other amplifier. And I know exactly why. That's because this amplifier requires a higher input to produce the same amount of power. But luckily, there is something that I can do, and that's tidy up a bit of cabling that's coming out of my transceiver. So instead of using this little patch cable to the chassis connector, I've now connected the main patch cable to that output of the driver box. Now, the output from this box is around 180 milliwatts, with this slider at full on the DATV Easy software. Of course, by the time the signal gets to the other end, it will be a lot lower, but will it be enough to provide a good signal on QO100? Well, the answer is yes. You can clearly see now that my signal is nice and strong and perfectly adequate for running DATV transmission up to QO100 on 2.4 gigahertz. Now I left this running, showing my test card and a few demo videos that I'd made for a good 20 or 30 minutes. The temperature of the heatsink only got up to around 34 degrees C and the amplifier is in my fully glassed out conservatory. So the question of whether or not the heatsink and fans would be adequate has clearly been answered. Yes, they are. And with the amp placed in a cooler location, I'm sure it would run a lot cooler. Now making this amplifier would not have been possible if it wasn't for the kind people at eRion. Now they provided me with the pallet after I approached them with my idea of making this amplifier. Now they're not cheap, well, for a ham, but in my opinion and what I've seen, they're working very well. Now one thing I was worried about was the quality of the amplified signal. Now dirty amplifiers or amplifiers which are driven to saturation can cause nasty artifacts on the transmission. Now if you look closely at the base of my transmission, you can see there are no nasty signal shoulders, breaching onto other parts of the band. Now that's always a worry when dealing with this type of amp at these type of frequencies. Anyhow guys, I hope you enjoyed this video series and I want to thank you for joining me on this journey. I also want to say a massive thank you to Dan from UIY.com and to Andreas from eRion. Now Andreas really helped out with the design and he answered all of my questions professionally and accurately. Now considering that I'm not a microwave expert, and building something like this can be dangerous, I'm just thankful that I've not yet burned my eyelids off. Anyway, until the next video, stay safe, thanks for watching, and maybe see you on QA100.